right then. Okay. Uh, very good evening to everybody out here in India who joined us for this uh, webinar. And thank you for Mark, who's joined us today from the US uh, at Omni War Ventures. Um, you know, uh, just to sort of put a perspective in place, uh, as I welcome everyone here today for this webinar, is that agriculture today in India is really at crossroads. I mean, you know, in, on one side, we have a population of about 1.3 billion people whom we have to feed. And that probably needs another 50% of added productivity by agriculture in order to do it really efficiently. And then in urban areas, we are seeing a shift altogether where people today want to uh, look at organic food and they want fewer pesticides and fertilizers in their food products. I mean, so this, I think of course there's prime minister who said that we look as a country, we should become self-dependent, particularly when it comes to food that we consume. So this, this means that a lot has to change. And I mean, agriculture itself needs to change a lot. So just to put a perspective in place, today in India, the agriculture land yield is about 2.4 tons per hectare. You know, while if you compare it with countries like China and Brazil, you'll find it's about 4.7%, 4.7 tons per hectare in China and 3.6 in Brazil, which means that India is really behind when it comes to maximizing its productivity. Now, if India were to, through technology, if India were to make this uh, yield and the productivity on the land rise, then we can probably only be able to produce the, the kind of yield that we want, particularly from our two main staple crops, which is wheat and rice. Nearly 40% of the Indian land would actually become free. So that could be used for so many other things. It could be used for things like organic agriculture or for growing other crops, which India needs. So the answer probably today is that how are we going to put agri-tech into place in a way that we are able to make this difference or change to the Indian agriculture that we are really, really looking at. So agri-tech is, it's not as if agri-tech is something new. It's already happening. In fact, if my data is right, in 2008 alone, 18, sorry, uh, uh, agri-tech received close to about $17 billion of funding across various investments. And then there are all the more new areas which are arising in agri-tech uh, today, which Mark is going to tell us about as he tells us about innovation and the use of data in agriculture. And of course, how we can increase the digital infrastructure to improve the agriculture of agriculture. So welcome once again, Mark. We're so delighted to have you over today. And we have got uh, almost 50 people who've joined us here today and we're looking to have more as we go forward. Um, it's evening out here, close to dinner time, but um, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation. And of course, it will be FP Live for anybody who wants to comment or write anything on it. So Mark, would love to for you to uh, tell us, you've got a diverse experience and you understand Indian agricultural market probably better than some of the people in India themselves. You've spent so much time over here. And of course, with your portfolio companies at Omni World, largely driving agricultural prosperity. What, is, what are the trends that you see in um, agriculture or agri-tech that should be first implemented in India to achieve what we are looking to achieve, which is higher crop yield? Sure. Um, so first, I want to reframe the issue for a second. Um, India doesn't really have a productivity problem, hmm. to be clear. Our productivity levels in, in most crops are lower than global norms. But, but let's take a giant step back and think from a food security perspective, okay? So one of the wonderful things, one of the great achievements of India over the last five decades has been, right, that India in, in 2020 is a food secure nation, right? We are no longer dependent, right, on, on grain imports as, as was the case pre-Green Revolution, where it was said that India had a ship to mouth existence dependent on U.S. grain, right, because of low yields and, and bad harvests. So India today is largely food secure. We produce the second largest amount of rice in the world, the second largest amount of wheat. We are number one in, in, in cotton production, number two in sugar, two in fruits, two in vegetables, one in milk, one in pulses, right? So for the most part, India feeds itself. Now, there are two exceptions to that. One very glaring, which is that two thirds of our edible oil is imported. Hmm. And then one slightly minor, which is that in any given year, we might import 
some amount of pulses to fill the gap, but there has been a surge in pulse production in the last few years, and that's been coming down. So let's, let's start from the perspective that we do not have a food security problem. We should solve the edible oil problem, but we don't have a food security problem. Okay. The second point to make to reframe the issue is that, and, and I, I'm sure that, that viewers here would have heard these stories, when there is a glut, right, a glut of potatoes or tomatoes or perishable produce, what happens in India when prices, when there's a glut and prices go down? The answer is that they get dumped, wasted, right? Farmers will literally, as a, as a demonstration, throw potatoes on the highway, right, to make the point that they're not getting remunerative pricing. So the issue here is when we talk about Indian yields aren't high enough, okay, what if we doubled them overnight? What would happen? We would be drowning in food because we don't have the ability to process, export, store, and manage it. We don't have the, the capability of managing a marketable surplus that is significantly higher than what it is currently. So I would always suggest that we reframe the issue of agriculture in India around the farmer itself. We have 13 crore farmers, okay? When you take their families into account, that is 70 crore people that are, that are dependent, right, on, on agriculture, right, that live on farm, right? 700 million people live on farm. And so the challenge is not how do we boost their yields, because to be clear, we will drown in all of those potatoes. We can't eat them. Um, the question is, how do we boost their incomes? How do we make it so that farming is not synonymous with poverty, right? right? How do we make it so that farmers see higher incomes, right? And then, then begins this, this multi-decade shift where there are fewer and fewer and fewer farmers as hopefully other elements of the economy, services and manufacturing, absorb the people that were previously, to be blunt, underemployed on farm. And that's really the challenge. And agritech, you know, so agritech is not just all about yields, right? It's really about solving three big problems. And this is very fundamental to what we do at Omnivore. We say there are three things that need to change in Indian agriculture. One is farm profitability needs to be radically higher. And this is consistent with what the prime minister has been working on the last few years, the Dalvai uh, report, Dalvai commission on doubling farmer profitability, doubling farmer incomes. The second is that Indian farmers need much higher resilience. We need to make them more resilient against all of the challenges they face in climate change, in weather, right, in, in, in labor, in every, you know, in financial risk. So we need to boost their incomes, but we also need to make their incomes more steady because part of the, what makes farming miserable is the boom and bust nature of it, right? If you speak, I, I remember once being at a farmer meeting in Guntur, in, in, in Andhra, okay? And yeah. there were about a hundred farmers there. And um, this, was a, this was an event uh, that was put on by uh, Koromando, which, which runs a network of, of, of agri retailers or, or did in those days. And these were progressive Andhra farmers. These were like Zamindar landlord types, okay? Guys, who, you know, people that are farming serious tracts of land, making north, everyone in that room was probably making north of six to eight lakh, which for a farmer is pretty high. And we were, I remember we were asking these questions, how many of you want your children to be in agriculture. And there was about a hundred farmers in the room. So you can say kind of as a percentage, about 3% wanted their children to be in agriculture. So when the richest farmers of India still want to push their kids out of the agricultural sector, you have to ask why. And we did. And the answer was that they felt that a government job or a corporate job was guaranteed salary at the end of the month. And in agriculture, you are perpetually dependent on multiple risks you cannot possibly control. And so the second challenge is the challenge of, of resilience. And the third challenge is sustainability, right? The biggest bottleneck on, in, on the future of Indian agriculture is water, right? But we're also using, you know, way too many toxic chemicals. 
right? We are draining natural resources to, uh, to run this. And, and it's illogical, right? You think about Indian agriculture, why the hell are we growing rice, right? Non for, basmati rice, fine, high, high prices and all of that. But why are we growing, right, rice that is procured by the FCI in Punjab and Haryana? Hmm. Right. Water, what places, you know, where we need to be very concerned about water. Why are we in Maharashtra, which is drought prone, growing so much sugarcane? Right. There is an, there, there's an element of, of logic that is lacking in our cropping patterns. And so these are the three elements that, that we think about when we think about what transformation. Um, I'm, I'm getting a poll that is being sent to me here uh, that just popped up from you guys. Um, you know, that's what, when we think about transformation, that's what we're looking at. And in terms of what themes, because I think you asked this, what themes we find the most attractive, right? Again, focused on profitability, resilience, and sustainability. I would say there are a couple of themes that, that come out in a big way. Probably the biggest theme is digitization, right? How do we connect the farmer upstream, midstream, and downstream with the people they need to be working with, with input suppliers, with market linkages, with advice, and with finance. And many, many, many of our investments are along this theme of digitization, right? So we, we've made an investment in a company called Dehat in Eastern India that works in UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Orissa. About four lakh farmers on the platform right now. And they are doubling the profitability of those farmers because they get them inputs at fair prices. They help sell their outputs at the best possible price, low cost financing combined with advisory. And, and so if you look across the different, you know, I would say there's sort of three big themes um, in Indian agritech right now. One is digitization. Right, and, and we think of that as, as having sub themes, right? There's a rural FinTech element to it. There is a farmer platform element to it. There are agri B2B marketplaces and there are farm to consumer brands. But all of these things essentially are about connecting the farmer and the agribusiness ecosystem through digital technologies, right? Another set of, of, of themes that we look at, we consider to be deep tech, right? Still digital but really focused on the application of sensors, satellites, drones, big data, algorithms, machine learning to yeah. far ag upstream agriculture and to the entire value chain, right? We, we've backed a company called Intello Labs that is using computer vision and machine learning to digitize what quality means in fresh produce because quality is subjective. Right? right now it's subjective. You go into a Monday and you will be told something is this quality and you have no idea if that's true. And by the way, it's not just you. Reliance doesn't know if it's true. Amazon doesn't know if it's true, right? Big food processing companies don't know if it's true because there's no standard. And so Intello Labs is digitizing that standard, but in a deep tech kind of way. And then the third probably area of innovation, and this is the least active of the three, Digitization, massively active, huge amounts of money pouring into that, right? Players like Dehat and Ninja Cart, you know, Samonati, Gram Cover, that's where most of the funding has been. Deep tech, less of it, right? But starting to come up. And then the third element is life sciences related to agriculture and food. And that's, that's sort of the dog that didn't bark in, in India, right? It's um, inexplicably low amounts of startup creation, negligible amounts of pipeline, and it's probably the space where, where some sort of public-private intervention is the most required. I get in trouble for saying this, but you can find more Indian passport holders running life sciences startups in one mile of Boston than you can in all of India. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's uh, the dichotomy of the situation. I, yeah, I mean, but it, it used to be like that in tech, right? It used to be like that for, for people in hardware and software. And that's changed. That brain drain is done, right? In fact, now we have people coming back, right? Thanks to, to Trump and global stupidity, right? And so in the digital space, 
right? Good people don't leave anymore the way they used to. And lots of NRIs have returned home. But in life sciences, that hasn't happened. And so you still have the best and brightest minds, they see minds in life sciences in California, in Boston, right? In Oxbridge, right? Not returning home yet. And that's something we need to fix. Sure. Now, you mentioned a good point, which is about profitability of uh, uh, startup, uh, profitability of the farmer, really, and the farm itself. And then you also mentioned that a lot of people do not want to today become farmers. They don't want the next generation of children actually getting into farming. Now, do you feel robotics uh, at some point of time, we could have more robotic farming? I mean, we've seen the documentaries and videos in US and in European markets where, you know, big farms and much bigger farms than are there are in India. The, the thing about India is that we have much smaller farms per household and therefore it's not profitable enough at times. So do you feel that robotic technology at some point of time could cover the gap of people not wanting to be farmers in the coming times? So let's, let's make a distinction between mechanization, automation, robotics, okay? So, so in general, mechanization in India <coughs> has been on the rise for the last 30 years and, and crazily so in the last 10, right? That's tractors, right? Basically getting human labor to reduce on farm. And unfortunately in India, mechanization has only really been tractorization so far, right? So there's very little automatic spraying that is done via tractors, right? Most automatic spraying in India is done with some dude and a backpack, right? And a backpack sprayer manually. Um, really the only, most seeding is still done manually, right? So really, if you look at what tractors are used for, for the most part, right? it's largely soil preparation, hmm. right? And then afterwards, everything else is still fairly manual. Um, and that's starting to change. You know, harvesters came in about 20 years ago. That has picked up in a big way. So let's think about this in sort of layers. Tractorization, that's happened, right? About seven, eight lakh tractors are sold every year in India. That's advancing very nicely. Broader mechanization, right? Is, is taking place now more aggressively than it did before. Yeah. Automation, right, is also happening across the value chain. All of that is, is part of the robotics story. Robotics is like the last stage, okay. right? So let's imagine, let's, let's imagine we're not in Punjab. Let's imagine we're in Iowa for a second, okay? In Iowa, the farmer right, sits in this massive, massive tractor, huge, right, larger than any tractor you can find in India. And they plow their fields in it, and they harvest their fields with harvesters. And it's an air conditioned cab, right? So it's like, it's like sitting in a car. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they don't steer themselves. It is, it is steered via satellite, okay, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure the steering is perfect, straight line and there's all this data being collected and every function is automated it's not just soil preparation seeding is automated spraying is automated and harvesting is automated that whole element can go a lot further than it has in india before we start talking about taking the farmer out of the cab and that's really what robotics is is taking the farmer out of the cab and that in the us in europe the farmer is still sitting in the cab Right, that's starting to change. There are a couple of, of you know, there are a couple of, of players in true farm robotics that are looking at getting the farmer out of the cab. So it's totally automated, but we have a long way to go, right? Before that becomes the most critical thing with respect to, to, to farm automation. That, all of that said, right? There are some really interesting, unique opportunities that work very well in India relating to small farm size, where you can actually get the tractor out of the picture, right? The tractor is not a perfect instrument. It's a, it's a, it's a byproduct of our dependence on the internal combustion engine 50 or 60 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 150 years ago when tractors really started. That was, you know, you needed a big internal combustion engine in order to bring any sort of power to the farm. Fast forward to 2020, we don't need that. We have electric motors, brushless motors, right? You don't need to drop a, a ton of metal 
in order to fulfill a task on farm. And so the interesting thing about farm robotics is potentially you're looking at robots that will entirely replace the tractor with something that is much smaller, that compacts the soil less, that's more nimble, and that, you know, is, is built from the very beginning without a farmer involved. So we've backed a company called Tartan Sense, which is Bangalore based. The entire team comes from Carnegie Mellon. So in that sense, it looks like every other robotics startup that's been funded in the world. We've done it together with Bloom Ventures and they are building tiny, tiny robots, right? Robots the size of, of you know, a bread basket that can go through the fields, monitor weeds, and if they identify a weed, destroy the weed, right? And that is entirely without a farmer being present. In fact, you know, the goal right now, it's, it's semi-autonomous, uh, which means that you put it on a row, it goes down the row, identifies and kills, right? And then you move it somewhere else. But eventually, it's going to be fully autonomous. And so you're going to have almost, I don't know if you're familiar with this thing, the Roomba, right? This little robot that, that you know, vacuums you're gonna have almost a Roomba for weed control. And that's where we're heading. So, and the nice thing about it is it's very low cost, right? So an individual farmer can afford it um, if they're large enough. And if they're not, we anticipate that in agri-robotics in India, you're going to see models of service where a village level entrepreneur buys it, buys one, and then services 10 or 20 farms with it right? And that's very similar to how, how, how harvesters have been introduced in India. Yeah, it's yeah. not that, you know, even the largest Punjabi farmer or farmers in Chhattisgarh that have been able to aggregate large amounts of land, even those tracts, those 200 hectares, are too small to justify the spend on a harvester. So harvesters in India have become effectively, it, it's almost like someone in the city buying a car to become an Uber driver, right? it becomes a service business and then you sweat the asset. And we anticipate that there will be agri-robotic cases in India, which are based on a similar kind of entrepreneurial model. Sure. I mean, we're seeing the rise of farming as a service today, more like SaaS, we have FAST, which is like, um, as I said, farming as a service. And you mentioned about automation and, you know, uh, because the farms are small, so we don't necessarily need to buy all those equipment. We can actually, you know, pool them together and... Uh, yeah, at the, village, at the village level, at the taluk level, at the district absolutely. level. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, do you see more startups, more tech startups who can facilitate this kind of automation? First, of course, understanding the Indian automation and the, the real need of automation over here. And do you further see an opportunity for more such startups to come in, which can help in automation? So let me make a distinction between product companies and service companies. Right. I think we need a lot more product companies with respect to automation. We need a lot of people to look at robotics. We need them to look at other right forms of automation. We need to look at next generation farm machinery, all of that. With respect to services, there, there were probably about 10 startups three years ago that were working in the farming as a service, automation as a service, machinery as a service, Uber for tractors yes. kind of place. They're all but, all but one is dead now. Yeah. All but one. And, and the reality is, it is very, and, and this is a lesson that I learned a decade ago when I was at Godridge, okay? It is very hard to compete with the informal economy. Hmm. It is very hard. And, and so when you start talking about tractors as a service, harvesters as a service, you have to remember that that's already happening. Right. Right. That's already happening. If you, if you go right in, in Eastern Rajasthan, okay. And go to a village, you will discover that there are tractor owners and they know their neighbors and they go out and service their neighbor's farms. You will see if you go, if you go to, um, you know, if, if you go to Jalandhar, Right. And you have and Ludhiana and you have all of these harvester machine, you know, machinery companies up there that are making desi harvesters, not the fancy John Deere ones. OK, sure. they get sold. And then those harvesters spend eight months a year crisscrossing India, going as far south as Tamil Nadu, harvesting the whole country. So, and, and, those, and those are not owned by corporates. In fact, when corporates have tried to take those businesses over, it's heavy overheads, 
right? You know, you, you just, you can't break even. It's very hard to compete with the cost structure of a village level Indian entrepreneur, right? We have HR departments, they have their mother. We have accounting and finance departments, they have their cousin, right? right? So it's just their cost structure for what is to be clear, a pretty thin margin business just makes them outcompete any attempt from a corporate or a startup to organize that space. It just hasn't worked yet. Sure. And I mean, given that you've said that, you know, that their whole working and their whole style of uh, operations is very different than what a business would look like in an urban area. How do you see the farmer being able to adopt somewhere midway between what the corporate is trying to give him and what is really what he's doing currently? I mean, you know what, from what you've told me, it seems that the answer is somewhere in the middle rather than really being at the corporate level or at the farmer's level itself. Look, I mean, I, I think the point is farmers that want automation, right? Whether they buy it or whether they lease it, it is available, okay? Sure. It can be made more affordable. The tech, the tech can be better. The products can be better. But, but in general, outside of, you know, some remote Adavasi kind of place, right? Y you can pretty much get what you need, what you want. Um, I think there have been various, you know, attempts by players to say, no, 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 we're going to aggregate all of it and get everyone on it. And, and the answer is, what's sure. the, exactly what's the benefit there, right? The business is, is kind of going on. You can make it slightly better, but platforms haven't worked as well there. I think there is much more space for platforms connecting input suppliers to farmers, making sure farmers get fair prices. But mechanization is one of these spaces that's, probably a bit more modern than people realized and more efficient than people realized. It's very easy sometimes, especially when you have, you know, urban founders that have aspirations that, that everything in Indian agriculture is backwards, right? And then they go discover that, no, it's, it's kind of the way it is for a reason and probably a little bit less backwards than you expect. Sure. No, that, that's, that's a great observation. And I mean, uh, this is particularly good to know that, you know, uh, I mean, they might have, farmers might have their own ways of working, but it really works for them. That's why it works. Uh, the whole system works like that. But of course, improvement is al always something that can be done. You know, uh, you've talked about mechanization and you've talked about yield. So let's touch upon distribution, which I think is a problem, not just in India, probably more in India, but it's really a problem in the world where, you know, not even 90%. I mean, I don't know many countries who can say that even 90% of their entire production actually is utilized and only 10% is wasted. I see, I've seen numbers of different countries. It's anywhere between 25 to 30% which gets wasted. In India, probably it's 50% or even more. So how do you, how do you see the distribution becoming more efficient through agritech? Look, I mean, there, there were, pre-COVID trends and post-COVID trends, right? Right. So, you know, pre-COVID trends over the course of the last five years, you've seen the rise of various marketplaces that are focused on disintermediation of the farmer, right? So that is, you know, there, you've seen Ninja Cart, you've seen Way Cool, right? You've seen other specialty players. We have a bet called Farmly and very specialized crops, but various startups started recognizing that all of these steps between the farmer and the consumer, that needed to change, right? And so some of them had a B2B focus, right? So for example, you know, Uran, Ninja Cart, right? Way cool. They're largely buying from the farmer, supplying the Kirana, Okay. Then right. others, or a food processor, then others, right, recognize that there was the potential to build a direct farm to consumer connect, right? So you've seen that we have an investment, Why Cook, that has done that. Um, you know, Country Delight has done that in dairy. Uh, Fresh to Home has done that in seafood. Licious has done that in meat, right? Yeah. So there yeah. was, we call those farm to consumer brands, okay? Yeah. We, our, our investment, Clover, is, is doing that as well. Um, so all of that together pre-COVID was, was happening. I think what's interesting now is, you know, I think COVID revealed for the first time just how fragile the system is and how overly dependent it is on Mondays 
and the existing channels. And so I think reforms, right, earlier this week, the government tabled three major initiatives, right? One initiative around the Essential Commodities Act, a second initiative around APMCs, and the monopoly that is the Monday and trying to break that, and the third initiative around contract farming. And I think all of this is a recognition that this legacy system that was built, right, for our food scarcity era, right, that, that the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, right, where profit was a dirty word and everyone was fearing the speculator and the hoarder, right? Fast forward to 2020, we are a food surplus nation. We export rice, okay? We, ex we are in, you know, we, we have huge exports in, in certain categories. And so I think there's a recognition that, that these systems that perhaps had a logic at one point of time in trying to quote unquote protect the farmer have in fact become fairly compromised monopolies that, that ensure a steady income to Bunyas. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and it's not even like if I wanted to be a trader and get an APMC license that I could get one, right? It's, it's very much like taxi medallions were in the US in the pre-Uber era, right? These were protected monopolies of rent seeking. And, yeah. and to be clear, traders have a purpose, right? They, they really do. But what we did is we allowed them to exist without competition. And I think what's happening now is a recognition that in order to make sure that the farmer is at the center of policy, right, in, in their actual lives, right, we're moving away from this monopoly system to a system that says, look, farmers, you have all the options. If you want to sell to your artia in your, you know, in the APMC, in the Monday, go right ahead. But if you want to sell directly to a food processing company, you can. If you want to sell to a digital platform, you can. However you want to sell, what, whoever gives you the best price, that's what makes us happy. And, and I think the government shifting to a position of neutrality rather than favoring right, the existing monopoly structure is probably a good thing. I don't think the traders are going anywhere. I don't think the APMCs are going anywhere. There's a lot of infrastructure there. There are a lot of very sophisticated actors. I think what you're going to see is a modernization of this whole space in a big way in the next few years. And hopefully that will be very positive for Indian agriculture. Sure, absolutely. You know, we've got some questions really pouring in from our audience. So I think it's time to actually start taking some of them. Uh, so Vinya, I think has a question. Can we give the audio to Vinya? Okay, let me, let me see. If, uh, so Dr. Vinaya Kumar has like that more marginal and small farmers are facing issues of market bargaining ability. What is your message to deal with this issue? Um, so my message is give them the option, right? So, so we need to create more options for, for these players, right? For, for small and marginal farmers. They need to be able to, you know, if, if you're selling something, the more people you can sell to, the better chance you have that you can identify a price that works for you or a price combined with a logistic solution or maybe a multi-year contract or maybe contract farming. I think th the whole point about market bargaining ability is to open up the options for those farmers, right? Because some of them, right, for example, you have farm to consumer brands where they will sell directly to a company that in turn will deliver directly to a consumer. And yes, that company will take their cut, but the way most of those companies are doing well, right, is paying the farmer more to make sure that product gets onto their platform and giving the consumer a fair price. And so I think, again, it's, it's about digitization. It's about opening up the playing field from a regulatory perspective and allowing the market to work. And, you know, I am not a market fundamentalist. I don't, you know, I think market failure is more common than people realize. But I think in this case, options will be a very positive thing. And you have more and more capital coming into the space. And you will start to see that farmers are able to find remunerative prices for themselves. Sure. Uh, we have G Birju Gariba next. Birju, if you can unmute, unmute, please. Unmute kindly before you ask the question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, so I, my question is pertaining to farm to home distribution, farm to fork directly. 
how well do you think is the network established currently whether it's organic or non organic and how much need do you see in today's day and age for that kind of a network given that government has opened up the whole neutralized the whole apmc uh, network look it it so, so how well established is it it's very nascent it's very urban right now right it's really only uh bangalore delhi to some extent mumbai pune hyderabad um you know when you look at the players that have scaled there right it you you've had the most successful in the dairy space has been country delight in meat in li- it's licious in fish it's fresh to home um but all of this is very very early days and i anticipate you will see you know geo take a play there you will see um amazon take a play there right i flipkart take a play there others will will enter that space uh as well um what's my opinion about it i think it for certain products it it makes a tremendous amount of sense i you know as a consumer would like to know where my fish is coming from as a consumer i'd like to buy higher quality milk that i know is sourced directly from farms maybe not organic farms but but you know good clean sustainable farms and so i think you know this is obviously very focused on middle and upper uh, class indian consumers for now but i think that kind of direct farm to home disintermediation is going to be a big trend uh because i think as as consumers become more particular about quality right the best way to understand quality right is to be in a very very short value chain where you have transparency on the back end and i think that's what these companies are trying to do but to be clear right now it's a drop in the bucket sure amazing uh, thank, thank you and may i just follow up with one small question you just mentioned about uh, four large uh, you know giants of uh, the nature of amazon and and likes do you think there is a scope for a small to mid sized company as well or is it only great for these giants I think small to mid-sized companies are either going to get acquired or die. Um I think that's just the nature of, you know, maybe maybe they'll be able to become mid-sized on their own, but you know, if you think about um we, you know, this space 3 years ago there were a ton of small to mid-sized players in it, right? Um Daily Ninja got acquired, you know, got acquired not on great terms um by by Big Basket. I should include Big Basket alongside Amazon and others, right? There was Dudwala that we invested in that that, you know, largely shut down, partially acquired. Um there were many many other places, many many other players. This is a space where size matters in a big way and and where just having one niche offering probably isn't enough when you've got others that can provide everything so let's see how it plays out but i i think over time this space will be consolidated by essentially the delivery giants and there'll be opportunities but you look at these a2 milk providers they're pretty regional in their entire approach and yet they're doing okay for uh, the kind of market that they serve let me make a let me make a distinction that's a fair point um you can build a lifestyle business absolutely right if you have a very narrow amount of distribution yeah. and a high value product yeah sure you can build a lifestyle business if you want to scale nationally right you're going to slam you're going to need a significant amount of investment and you're probably going to get choked off by one of these players so so honestly if i'm an a2 business okay and i want to build let's say a national a2 business I would focus on the product maybe in my early years I do a bit of regional local distribution but eventually I don't have an advantage in doing that distribution so I focus on the product itself and I get the product listed on milk basket I get the product listed on Amazon I get the product listed on big basket rather than saying that I should have my own delivery voice Sure our next question comes from Prabhat uh, if uh, Prabhat Is he online? Okay, please unmute Prabhat. Uh, thanks, Ritu. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. My question to you is: I'm currently researching the space for investments, and uh, I was looking at agri fintech. So, is agri fintech an attractive and sizable market opportunity for uh, agri tech investors like yourself? 
and do you think margins are you know attractive in this space or or at this moment more integrated full stack models are something that you're more excited about so i think full stack models the space of full stack is getting very crowded right now um and some some winners are emerging that are going to kind of suck more and more and more of the cash being invested in that segment I think agri fintech is is a fascinating space. We have an investment. Uh, we have two investments in agri fintech. We invested in Gram Cover, which is probably the the biggest insure tech space player in rural India, and um, we invested in Aria, which is a post harvest services platform where warehouse finance is a big part of that. If I were, if you're, if you're asking me, should you look at value chains versus agri fintech? I th actually think agri fintech is in its very early days. You have very few players. It's an interesting space and you should absolutely look at it. Thank you, Mark. You're okay, quite welcome. So there's Arunishwar next. Uh, go ahead, Arunishwar. Please unmute first. Uh, sir, good evening. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes. Sir, uh, why there are uh, many uh, middlemen in the agriculture supply chains in India? Why are there many middlemen? I mean, I think two reasons. One is the supply chains are quite fragmented. You have many, 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 many farmers on one side, 130 million. Right? And you have hundreds of millions of consumers on the other. And as a result, right, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, if you had capital, right, you could make money buying from one and selling to the other. Yes, right? sir. That's just, you know, that's, I mean, to be clear, it's not just an Indian thing. That was true everywhere in the world. Um, you know, traders have existed to, to bridge, right, to bring the integration of, you know, to, to link supply and demand and to overlay finance to make that all work. So I think what happened in India is that while every other sector of the economy after 1991 was allowed to reform, you know, agriculture was quote unquote protected under the, you know, under the premise that farmers needed protecting. In reality, a lot of that was protecting middlemen. And so I think that's what's starting to change. Sure. Thank you. So we're getting a question on Facebook, which is really from Pinaki Das, who's asking, how do you see North East India as part of the agri-tech industry. So which opportunities do you see? And could you see uh, some investment money or towards sustainable business in agri-tech industry in that part of the country? So I, uh, for a Farang, I know the Northeast fairly well. I made an invest, I was the only VC who had a Northeastern investment um, that I know of. Uh, we invested in a, in a food processing business in Guwahati in 2013. Uh, to be clear, pretty tough experience. Um, look, the Northeast is historically a, a laggard with respect to, to agricultural development um, because of everything that comes with the Northeast. You are, you know, things are more expensive there because you're cut off from the rest of India. Logistics are very difficult, getting better to be clear, but still quite hard, right? You've got to ship product, right, through Boroland where frequently you will have demonstrations. I remember um, I, I almost once created like a, a spinning wheel of what was the problem in the Northeast this time. It was like, okay, is it Bihu? Is it demonstration? Is it bombs? Is it the Boros have shut the border, right? You could like pick what was wrong with the company at any given moment um, between all of these challenges. To be clear, the Northeast has some wonderful advantages, right? It has amazing you know, microclimates that you can grow things there you can't grow anywhere else in the country. And I think that, for example, it's not technically one of the seven sisters, but Sikkim has shown that you can build a very interesting ecosystem around organic, right? Because you have a manageable amount of farmers and, you know, and you can enforce a system to focus on, you know, really, really, really tasty, clean um, and, and high value crops. I think there are some really interesting opportunities in the Northeast. I think there's a lot of potential for small businesses that can be quite successful. Is it a priority for, for most agri-tech startups? 
if they're not in T, probably not because for the most part, it, there's lower hanging fruit to be found in the West, in the South, in the North. I think some of these agri-tech platforms will come to the Northeast, I'm sure of it. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's just, a, it's on average, a more difficult region to operate in. And, sure. and I say that not from ignorance, but from brutal experience. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, uh, while we're talking about uh, uh, different markets, another, you know, farming today, urban farming is becoming another new phenomena that we're seeing, whether it is organic farming or whether micro green farming, it's something which is really on the rise. Now, what opportunity do you see in this? And I mean, you know, obviously there's a trend towards healthier eating, which is where people look for these smaller farms which are doing organic products. I mean, do you really see this as a scalable business model or as like you said, for A2 milk, it's going to be a very small regionalized distribution and therefore should not be thought of as bigger? So let me make a distinction between protected agriculture as a theme and urban agriculture and microgreens, okay? Protected agriculture means poly houses and net houses. And there are only about 50,000 acres of in, in India that are under protected agriculture. And there is huge scope for more, right? We should have you know, a tremendous amount of our horticultural production under protected agriculture in poly houses and in net houses, okay? Um, and we've made a bet in that space, Clover, which is essentially dark farms that aggregate these greenhouses and then market the produce, the high quality produce under B2B and B2C brands. And I think there's massive, massive scope for that. Now, what is urban agriculture? Urban agriculture is largely, right? Um, well, it's largely a Western phenomenon right now. And it's basically how do we use urban space to grow? Okay. Now, why do you need to do that? You need to do that because, you know, in urban America, where this has taken off, farms are very, very, very far away from the cities, right? So you're shipping fresh produce from California to New York so that someone can have a lettuce, right, in, uh, in December. That is not the case with Indian cities, right? You get in Mumbai and you drive, right, an hour and a half outside and the farms start immediately, Right? And those farms are where most horticulture that is coming into the cities are being grown. We're not shipping palak from one side of India to the other. Every city is growing palak outside of it for its own domestic consumption in exurban, periurban, right? Kind of two hours, maybe three hours away from the city. So the need for quote unquote urban agriculture in India is a bit less. The other thing to remember is that we have quite a bit of land and we have a lot of sun, right? So it's not like, you know, Newark in you, you, one of the biggest players in the US is Aero Farms, right? And their facilities are in warehouses, in buildings, and they use LED lighting so that they can have 12 month a year growing. We anyway have 12 month a year growing in India. So the need for urban agriculture is a bit different. We need much more poly houses. We need more protected cultivation, but this kind of LED centric urban agriculture in India, I, I, I'm not sure that that's required the same way. As a result, when people are doing those kinds of projects, right, if you have an entrepreneur in the city, they're going to go towards the most high value added, expensive products imaginable. And hence you bring up microgreens. Let's be very blunt. Only people who watch webinars like this eat microgreens. Okay. If, if we go to your, your, your nana nani doesn't, they don't know what microgreens are, okay? I, I have, there's a term that I, I think Bloom came up with where they, they call it avocado startups. And it means startups that are relevant for people who eat avocados, okay? If the top five to 10 million Indian consumers. So yeah, I believe you can, you can do interesting urban agriculture products. And in Mumbai, you know, Bandra, Juhu, right? South Bombay, Kolaba, these are all places where you'll find consumers who want to buy that stuff. But when we're really talking about stuff that moves the needle on Indian agriculture, these are much more niche consumer plays. And I think, you know, we, we bet on Clover versus some of these other things, because we think, you know, what we're really talking about is moving towards protected climate resilient agriculture and not necessarily very niche solutions focused on the top half of 1% of Indian consumers. 
Sure. A lot of people out here are asking about hydroponics farming as well. I mean, what opportunities do you see? Do you see? So hydroponic is between these two points, right? So plenty of, um, it just really depends on what you're growing, right? So if you're growing lettuces, right? And you want to sell them to Subway or to a local restaurant, then hydroponics is very nice because, you know, you don't have soil that's tied up, that, that's caught up in the lettuce. You don't have dirt that you have to clean and remove, right? And, and in general, right, you have a lot of control in terms of crop nutrients and other things. Um, but hydroponics is, is one type of solution associated with protected agriculture. It doesn't necessarily need to be urban farming. Right? You can go out three hours outside of Bangalore and you will find protect greenhouses that are operating hydroponically right? where, where, there's no where there's no soil. So it's just a technology that sort of spreads across this spectrum from more generic polyhouses to more specific right, niche uh, urban farming operations. Someone's also asking, do you think it makes sense to do organic farming for India or better to export it? Look, I, I think India has a proclivity for organic that is ahead of where you would expect um, the country to be in terms of, uh, in terms of incomes. And, and the analogy that I always share with people is, you know, Fab India is kind of the case study here, right? So for, for decades, right, Indian consumers have been buying, you know, organic cotton kurtas at Fab India um, because, and, and Fab India has built sort of an organic brand. They, they also have an organic food brand. And I think there is, you know, India is a very diet conscious culture, right? It has to be religiously. You have people that are, you know, you have Shravan, you have, I don't eat meat on Tuesdays, right? You have notions of sattvic and purity and all of these things that are just not there in most of the world, right? So I think Indians are a little hardwired you know, you have Ayurveda, you, you, you're a little hardwired to like organic relative to other cultures, mm -hmm. I think, because of these food traditions. So I think there is a play in organic in India. I think there's also a play outside, right? So Mintur does huge exports of organic um, materials, organic crops outside of India. I think organic is a good solution. I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it's a panacea for the land. I don't think it's a panacea for farmers but there's definitely an opportunity there and it's worth exploring. You just have to think very hard about the value chain you're playing in. Sure. And so there's one question coming from Rahul Kumar, if we can give him the audio. And I think this is probably the last question. We're almost uh, uh, there on time, but we have a lot of other questions, Mark. So if you know, you can take me. It's five. okay. I, I, I've got, I've got, a, I've got five minutes. Um, is Rahul Kumar joining? Uh, yes. Yes, am I audible? Yeah, I can. No, I even so, actually, no, my, my next call is not for, I, I have time. So if you want to run it a couple minutes oh, late. Sure. Then. Yeah. Okay, so I hope I'm audible. Yeah, I can, yeah. can I ask the question? Yeah. Please. Yeah, so Mark, uh, so my question is basically uh, from technology side. Uh, I follow agriculture technology, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I am tracking this from last five years and working as an analyst. So basically, you know, when you talk about agriculture technology, then we have seen that tremendous adoption in, in those countries which have uh, larger farms like, uh, you know, US, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, even in uh, European countries. But India, we have, uh, you know, the uh, most of the farms are less than two hectares. In fact, 90% of the farms are below two hectares. So yep. what is your view on adoption of uh, technology, basically, which are used in precision agriculture and uh, technology like VRT, guidance, remote sensing. So what is your view when we will have a scalability for this kind of technology in India? So it's already happening. Let, let's, let's make a distinction between, because I, I think as, as people who are sort of veterans of agribusiness, right, there's a tendency to think that things are moving very, very slowly because we've all been working to try to modernize Indian agriculture. I, I've you know, I started, my first job in Indian Ag was I interned for ITC in 2005, okay? So I've spent a lot of my life working in the space and it's very easy to get, you know, kind of cynical and say, oh, nothing's happening, oh, it's very slow. But let's remember something. A lot of, a lot of agri-tech is premised on information and until very recently, your average Indian farmer did not have a smartphone, 
right? So I think with the rise of 4G and with the rise of Geo and with the rise of low cost Android handsets, which are to be clear, it's really the last five years. And if you look at the acceleration, the dramatic accelerations in the last 24 months, the, the necessary technology, base technology, platform technology to facilitate um, agri-technology wasn't there. And so I think what we're seeing right now is a massive pickup in the ability of agri-tech startups to, to scale and reach farmers. When we started Omnivore in 2011, and for our first few years, most of the startups that we backed were really B2B startups focused on the agribusiness ecosystem because you couldn't get direct access to farmers. There was no way to reach them. Today, you have WhatsApp, you have Facebook, right? You have the geo platform. There are all of these ways to actually reach farmers directly and onboard them that was never possible before. So I think in that sense, that's a major change. When you ask about, you know, the issue of land, as I spoke to earlier when we were discussing automation, right? Just because, right, your average farmer has 1.2 hectares, right? Under that logic, no one would own a tractor, no one would own a harvester, but we all know there are tractors and we all know there are harvesters. So the point at which agritech intersects with the agribusiness ecosystem may also facilitate that kind of modernization and, and the adoption of precision. So for example, you know, if you look at, at Mahindra, Mahindra is working with startups to get precision agriculture technologies embedded in their tractors. So when their tractors are sold, regardless of whether it's used by a farmer or a village level entrepreneur or some like small company that owns 20 tractors and runs a service business, right? In all of those cases, the precision agriculture solution will be there. So I think we, the, and then finally, the last point that I would make is, and I, I like I said, I, I get in trouble for saying these things sometimes, right? People are always like, you know, why isn't your, why aren't your companies focused on marginal farmers? And I'm like, okay, when Xiaomi started selling mobile phones in India, do they walk into the Ravi and start selling them or do they start selling them to rich people? Right? You, you don't necessarily start at the absolute bottom of the pyramid. You have to remember that about 15% of Indian farmers own approximately 48% of the land in India. Right? India, everything in India is stratified. Everything is, is hierarchical. The, the aver there is no average Indian farmer. Right? And so it shouldn't be a surprise that most agri-tech startups are focused on the half of the land that's owned by 15% of the population that are the larger and more progressive farmers. That's not to say, you know, our portfolio company, Dehat, is working with marginal farmers in Bihar. But if you're starting, you, you can't see 130 million farmers as a homogenous mass. You have to figure out what value chains, what segments, what land holdings, what crops, you want to participate in and disaggregate that and identify the opportunities. And so I think the last thing to understand is I do expect that agritech will accelerate much more in the top, you know, top 20% of, of Indian farmers than in the bottom 80 for the next few years. And then it'll go down to the next 20% and then the next 20% and from there. Do you, do you see yourself, I mean, you said that uh, 48 to 50, 15% and uh, do you, I mean, would you want to see an India where there would be 30% owning about 70%? Do you think that would help solving the agriculture problem? I only want to see that if the other people have jobs, right? The, the reality is agriculture is like a, a, a sponge, right? For the underemployed. And we're seeing that, like, look, look at what's happening right now. We have 13, you know, we have about 100 million migrants that have returned back to villages. Yeah, I don't think, to be clear, I think they're going to struggle, but I don't think they're going to starve because agriculture is the sponge for labor, right? It mops up the excess, right? And a lot of people in, in agriculture are underemployed, right? Which is why farmers push their children into government jobs, into cities, into private jobs, even being a peon, right, in an office, over being underemployed on farm. I think in general, what I would like to see over time, right, is not the concentration of land from an ownership perspective, like, because I think land is a very valuable asset, but I, I would like to see a world where farmers can safely, legally lease 
land to other farmers, right? And have those farmers, right, manage in, an, in, a, in larger and larger and larger operating holdings, right, that bring efficiencies without necessarily seeing a hyper concentration in land, which I, to be clear, think would be a terrible thing. Sure. We have another question from Vinod. You have another five minutes, Mark? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. So we have another question from Vinod Dable, if he's around. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. We can hear uh, you. Hi, Mark. Uh, hi, Ritu. Uh, so my question was uh, about how is the future uh, that you're looking at right now for a ready-to-eat food processing industry, which completely rely on the agriculture business, which is a backbone uh, for the food processing industry, like ready to eat foods. So I think there are certainly opportunities in, in food processing. I think it's a great space for, for SMEs in particular, right? You know, I think, I think there's huge scope there. I think the one thing that we have to remember is that um, Indian food habits are not that flexible, right? And, and this is a country where people in general want homemade fresh food and in fact have migrated from homemade fresh food to homemade to to cloud kitchen made delivery food that is hot and have bypassed a lot of processed food so if i look at the kind of when i was a kid growing up in the states i ate a ton of frozen food i ate a ton of canned food there was all of this there were all of these kind of meal kits that, you know, things like, uh, you probably never heard of it, hamburger helper, rice aroni, all of this stuff that existed that, that helped speed up meal prep times, right, for dual income families in the US. And none of that is there in India. And India has largely bypassed a lot of that. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting reasons for it, but RTE has not, for the most part, been very successful, right? You know, it, it, in reality, most RTE in India is bought and then put into the luggage of students going to study abroad, right? So they can have chana masala when they're, when they're living in, you know, when they're studying at Iowa State, right? It's not really consumed very much in India. And so I think you just have to be very aware of if you're going to do something in RTE, that there's probably a reason it hasn't taken off in, in, the, way it, in the way people expected it to 10 or 20 years ago, and just choose accordingly. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the next is from Amish Modi. Amish, Abhinod, can you please mute yourself? And sure, sure. Have Amish? Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, uh, wonderful talk. I just wanted to understand what, uh, what do you think the near-term future of organic uh, producers and the challenge we face is people's skepticism towards it, you know, whether it's actually organic or it's whitewashed organic. So how does a retailer, you know, tackle that? Look, I think you need to have organic product companies that can prove their product is organic because the reality is for three lakh and, you know, you can buy any organic certificate you want, right? And so, and I think, I think consumers realize that um, and hence there is a bit of skepticism around, you know, organic that's, that's sold domestically. I think over time as digitization facilitates direct farmer connect, right? You're going to be able to show your consumers right? This is farmer, you know, Ram in Telangana, right? And here is, you know, and we have a QR code and you know, it came from this farm. And here is the soil sample from this farm that shows that there's nothing wrong in the soil. And you'll be able to kind of build, and, and some people are looking at blockchain for this. Um, you'll be able to kind of prove that, no, it's actually organic. Um, but the other thing is that we have to remember that organic is, is not a panacea. It's it can be good for farmers, right? If, if, it, if it gets them paid more, but if their yields are terrible because organic is hard and people are not giving them the price that they deserve, then it can be worse. And so I, I think, you know, I think it's also important to understand what categories work well with organic and what categories work less well. I don't think, you know, I think there is definitely scope for more humanely raised non-veg right? More, you know, quote unquote, organic dairy, A2 dairy or otherwise. Um, I think in a lot of other categories, uh, the consumer is more indifferent uh, domestically. And, and, and sometimes it's also a function, you know, with Indian consumers, it's really all about taste. So 
if you're charging someone more for something that is ostensibly organic, but it doesn't taste better, I don't think the consumer is going to stick with it. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one final question from Dian Datta. Um, is he online? Please unmute Dian. We'll need to unmute before you ask the question. Hello. So I, so I see the question, which is, what's the scope of inland aquaculture? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually think the scope in inland aquaculture is massive. Aquaculture is one of the brightest spots in the Indian agricultural economy. In the shrimp sector, you have literally 50,000 farmers and $5 billion of exports on the other side of it, right? Um, the fish sector has been much less developed, but in general, I think, it's a very, I, I think there is huge scope for growth. Indian exports are being able to prove themselves to be very high quality. You find them in supermarkets in, you know, in the U.S. in a big way. Um, there's scope in China, there's scope in Japan, there's scope in Europe. But there's also a lot of domestic scope, right? Almost no shrimp that is grown in India stays in India. It's almost all exported. So there's definitely scope to develop better value chains direct to consumer in, in seafood, you know, in, in both shrimp and fish. And in general, aquaculture, the, the, you know, what's called the FCR, the conversion of feed into meat in aquaculture is very, very high, you know, high, better, even better than chicken, which itself is very efficient. So when we're looking at trying to find low cost sources of protein for, for Indian consumers, aquaculture is a very good bet. So I, yeah, I, I mean, we've, we have two investments there. We have Eruvaca, which is an IOT company uh, in partnership now with Nutreco. And we have Aqua Connect, which is building the largest uh, platform for aquaculture farmers in India. So yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of scope. Sure, thanks very much, Mark. And as we uh, call it a close, would love to uh, hear from you as to if the next three sectors, I mean, as you said about uh, aquaculture, maybe what are the next three sectors or trends that you see where you would, you would bet your dollar on? So I think the alternative protein space is very interesting, very nascent, um, but India is a massive global producer of, of, mill, of millets and pulses. And even if alternative protein is not domestically interesting uh, in India as a consumer play, I think as a, as a production supply play, it's quite interesting. Um, I would definitely endorse what I said earlier and say that, that agri-fintech is a space that's barely been explored. And it's certainly a space that we're keen on, on more opportunities. And then um, I really want to see more life sciences deals. I, I think that, you know, people are not, global companies are not focused on India with respect to life science technologies um, and, and solving the problem space by Indian farmers at Indian price points. And so we need domestic entrepreneurs to do that. And they're not right now. Barely. So um, we would like to see a lot more in that space and bet more heavily in that space. Sure. And hopefully, you know, I mean, you, you, you have such vision of agriculture all across, uh, across the spectrum of the country and also about rural as well as urban. I mean, we would love to have people like you in the government sitting in the Ministry of Agriculture and actually advising the government about how they can fix the problems. So let's, give the ministry, let's give the ministry their due. Um, they have done more in the last month from a reform perspective than it has been done in, in 15 or 20 years. I completely so, agree. Um, I, I am a critic when I need to be a critic, and I will praise when I should praise. And I think this is one of the moments where there has been some very farsighted uh, activity that hopefully will translate into a, a big bang moment in, in Indian agriculture um, that, that makes everyone better off. And surely more agricultural technology would only facilitate it further. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us, Mark. This Thanks talk everyone. is really live on uh, Facebook. So if anybody has more questions, please keep on asking over there. We would ask probably Mark or his team to maybe if they can take a while to answer some of the questions which are there on our social networks. I'm very happy to. Is it going up on YouTube as well? It will go on YouTube, but right now it's on Facebook. Uh, okay. It will go up on YouTube by tomorrow, maybe. So. 
happy to answer more questions and also personally you can reach out to me on linkedin or any other channel and if you have some ideas or some areas on which you would like us to do more webinars or some subjects you would like to discuss we're always happy to look at them and facilitate them further and also get experts who can talk to you about them thank you very much for joining everyone us. see you thank bye you. bye Mark. thank you and thank you to all the attendees thanks for the questions cheers thanks ritu bye thank you